Heavenly Father, as we're coming to the conclusion of this um, weekend of study, we ask that you would finish this uh, presentation, these themes that we've raised in a um, consistent and logical way that we can um, take all this weekend into our hearts and our minds and go home and do our work of testing what we're hearing. We thank you for providing such a, a peaceful and calm atmosphere, even though we've been at three different locations, and we thank you for allowing us to be among the, the handful of people here on planet Earth at this time in history that, that is um, dealing with these subjects that are of such vital importance. Please send your Holy Spirit, your angels, um, to guide and direct in this study and help uh, the, the humanity in each of us prevent it from getting in the way of um, hearing what you have for us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> We're there's still one other point I would like to make on the last presentation before we get into s to number 12, the three abominations of desolation. Uh, for me, it's important to see this and it uh, is in connection with power, seat, and authority in the sense that the, the historical date that's associated with the seat is the year 330 when Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople. The, the time when the civil authority was given to the papacy was the decree of Justinian in 533, a, a singular point in time. Uh, some of the pioneers tend to put 533 together with 538. They'll say that the authority was given to the papacy in 533, but it wasn't until the Goths were removed from the city in 538 that they had the power to exercise that authority. The pioneers do not place the same distinction upon it that I place upon it, but I don't think we're in disagreement with each other. I'm, I'm being more specific about these events as they align with the end of the world. And the, the power, the, the power, the giving of the power to the papacy by the seven European kings from the year 496 to 508 and then beyond, they continued to supply the military to the papacy afterwards. But the process of those seven European kings coming into church-state relationship is from 496 to 508, um, needs to be acknowledged as a process. It's a... It's not a singular point in time. It's 496 to 508. It's, de it's describing a work um, that progresses. And when you begin to look at the history that th that action is pointing forward to, you begin to see that uh, Clovis, the first of the seven European kings, when he came into church-state relationship with the papacy, he has there's several points in his history uh, that you can line up with Ronald Reagan in the Reagan years when the United States first began to come into this uh, position of placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. But, but you shouldn't forget there that if you're comparing Clovis with Reagan, which I think is valid and can be supported, that Clovis is the first of seven kings. So Reagan is the first of a, a progressive work. It, it progresses um, until the papacy is placed upon the throne of the earth. And this is in agreement with the, uh, the overall study of the United States in Bible prophecy. The United States is the power that changes. It begins as Protestant America, ends up as apostate Protestantism. Um, every power in Bible prophecy has two components, a spiritual and a political. Uh, the political manifestation of the beast is, Catholic, or is, is a monarchy. The Pope is a kingly power. The religious manifestation of the beast is Catholicism. Every um, power has this dual station. The political manifestation of the dragon is um, what we call socialism or communism or Bolshevism or Nazism. There's, there's many manifestations of the dragon power's government, but it's all the same thing. Socialism, communism, um, Nazism, they're the same political structure with just a few minor variances, fascism. Uh, same with the dragon's religion. 
The dragon is spiritualism, it's Buddhism, Hinduism, New Ageism. Um, the religion of the dragon is spiritualism, and it comes in a variety of manifestations. The politics of the dragon is socialism with a variety of manifestations, but they're all basically the same. Um, that's one of the characteristics of the dragon, many manifestations. And the United States, its political manifestation, democracy, republicanism, however you want to tag it there, its religious manifestation is Protestantism. And the United States is the power that change, changes. It, there's a progression of change in the United States. And both the religious and the political side of the United States is going to fall. And, and this is an agreement with what Sister White teaches. Now, but let me ask you a question before I share what I, one point that Sister White teaches. Um, when did the religious um, aspect of the United States fall? Everybody agree, 1989? That's not right, but I'm glad you took a shot. <laughs> when did the religious manifestation of the United States fall? 1842. The organized churches in the United States closed their door to the Millerite, to the first angel's message. And Sister White says the Protestant churches in the United States went into perfect dark, perfect and complete darkness from that point on. We should remember that. If we have a tendency to turn on these Protestant preachers on the television or radio, they're in perfect darkness. To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. So there's a political manifestation of the United States. When did that fall? 1989. In fact, for me, I don't, I don't have a specific date, but if I had to pick, if, if I was going to pick a date, I would put 1984 in the Ronald Reagan years, because that's when Reagan appointed an ambassador to the Vatican. And in Harry Truman's presidency, he attempted to appoint uh, uh, an ambassador to the Vatican, and all the Protestant churches in the United States protested, and he withdrew his nomination. But when Ronald Reagan nominated an ambassador to the Vatican in 1984, all the Protestant churches said, Amen. And politically, we started walking with the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. So for, for me, the Ronald Reagan years, 1984, if you're forced to select a specific time, both the religious and the political aspect of the United States had fallen, and the United States began to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy. But it's going to reach its complete fall at the Sunday Law in the United States. That's where the cup of iniquity is filled to its full in the United States. So when you go back into what Sister White says, Sister White says the fall of Babylon in 1842, in fulfillment of the second angel's message, it's progressive. It's progressive, she says that. Um, it, the fall of Babylon came to the United States in 1842 when the organized churches closed their church. The second angel's message arrived in history. Babylon has fallen and has fallen. But she comments that this fall is progressive. So what I'm saying is, is when you're looking at the United States, which has been prefigured by pagan Rome, Pagan Rome, the, the aspect of pagan Rome that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth was the military strength of the seven European kings. And when we see the seven European kings illustrated in Bible prophecy, they're illustrated in a progression. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven European kings from 496 to 508. And Ronald Reagan is simply the first in the progression. Now, I probably shouldn't put this on the tape. I'm not saying this. I'm not, uh, I'm not pushing what I'm going to tell you, but there, there are some people that get to this point in their understanding where they're familiar with what we're talking about right now. And they say, okay, how many terms of president, how many terms was Ronald Reagan president for? Two. Who was the president after him? Bush Sr. How many terms was he president? Then who was president? For how many terms? Then who was president? Bush. What terms he in? Seven. <laughs> I'm not pushing that as a, as a, I just think about it. It's okay to stretch your mind in, in Bible prophecy. It's okay to stretch your mind. The, the seven European kings, beginning with Clovis in 496, are a type of the growth of support for the papacy that takes place in the United States at the end of the world. 
He was the first king followed by six kings. Um, so it's a progressive, there's a progression there. There's other reasons to take note of this progression, but uh, it's beyond the scope of this study. And you can see this progressive fall on page 102, um, or some of we deal with a little bit of that. Um, so we'll now take up um, three abominations of desolations. We we've, we've did some advanced discussion on this. There are certain prophecies in the Bible that are triple applications of prophecy. One of the characteristics of these prophecies is that they have some connection with Rome. And why would that be important to take note of? Because Rome establishes the vision. Daniel 11, verse 14. The prophetic subject of Rome, according to Daniel 11:14, 14, is the subject that establishes the vision. So here we are at the end of the world when the vision of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is the vision that God's people need to understand. And inspiration has forewarned us that the, the prophetic key that allows us to understand Daniel 11, 40 to 45 correctly is the subject of Rome. And the pioneers never understood a triple application of prophecy. I mean, maybe some of them understood it, but they never you know, pointed out that as a, a truth. And... Uh, the, the pioneers did, though, particularly if you go into the trumpets, they noted that when it comes to Rome, Rome is divided in threes. A number for Rome, there are a lot of ways in Bible prophecy to show that three is a number of Rome. If you go into the trumpets especially, um, if you look at the, the fifth and the sixth trumpet in Revelation chapter 9, you're going to see... A third part of the trees were burnt up, a third part of the seas, a third part of the waters, third, third, third. Read Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, and you'll find that the pioneers have an understanding for the third of the trees, the third of the waters, and it always had to do with the threefold division of Rome, whether it was identifying an attack that was coming on this third of the empire or the other third of the empire, um, the pioneers pointed out that Western Rome was divided into three and Eastern Rome was divided into three. Um, Uriah Smith will point out that um, Constantine, uh, when he moved to Constantinople, the capital to Constantinople, he then divided the Empire of Rome up into three. And he gave a third of the empire to one of his sons, a third to another of his sons, a third to another of his sons. So Eastern Rome was divided into three. Western Rome was divided into three in the sense that Western Rome, where the city of Rome is, the city of Rome, Western Rome, is where the government that was invented by the Roman Empire was centered. And the government in the Roman Empire was a threefold form of government, what the United States government is based upon. It had an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. They called it the Caesar, the Triumphant, and the Senate. But the pioneers point out that this threefold division of government in Western Rome was how Western Rome was prophetically divided in three. Um, and then, of course, when we get to Revelation 16, we see that modern Rome is divided in three, beast, dragon, false prophet. There are other instances in Bible prophecy where the number three can be I associated with Rome. The pioneers recognized, identified some of these, not all of these, but when it comes to Rome, three is a symbol that's associated with Rome. So when you come to these triple applications of prophecy that we're dealing with now, and we see that they always have some connection with Rome, there's a, a prophetic inspired logic to it. Um, we looked at the three Elijahs. Elijah the first dealt with Jezebel, Ahab, the prophets of Baal, an impure woman, a corrupt church at the end of the world, a civil power, Ahab, a deceiving power. Elijah II, John the Baptist, dealt with the identical set of Herodias, Herod, and Salome does the dance of deception. That's a triple application of prophecy. The, the characteristics of the first Elijah combined with the characteristics of the second Elijah define the the characteristics of the third Elijah, and that 
That formula is based upon another principle that we started with the very first presentation. Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. The testimony, the prophetic testimony of the first Elijah, confirmed with the testimony of the second Elijah, establishes the testimony of the third Elijah. That is one of the triple applications of prophecy that deal with Rome. We looked at the one, uh, one previously where pagan Rome, one testimony, combined with papal Rome, defined the characteristics of modern Rome. That's a second triple application of prophecy we referred to, did not go into detail, to the very message that we were raised up to proclaim. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Nimrod's Babylon is fallen. Belshazzar's Babylon is fallen. Those two prophetic testimonies, Nimrod, Belshazzar, define the prophetic characteristics of the fall of modern Babylon. Triple application of prophecy dealing with Rome. Modern Rome is modern Babylon in prophetic terminology. Um, we're now going to look at... Uh, something that is not widely um, acknowledged in Adventism, but that the abomination of desolation is a triple application of prophecy. And uh, this is e pretty easy. We ha I have some, some long quotations here that we're not going to read. They're going to be here in, your, here in your notes. You can consider them lately. I'm going to give this to you simply. Um, <coughs> we're familiar generally in Advent. Well, let me, let me say something first. We've been through quite a bit of material here the past, you know, whatever it's been, 50, 60 hours. Um, the pioneers were correct on what the abomination of desolation is in the book of Daniel. We, we'll all agree with that. We may, there may be some of us that want to argue about what the pioneers thought about the daily. But when it comes to the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel, the pioneers said it was the papacy, and everybody agrees, correct? The, the papacy is the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel, correct? If you believe that, please raise your hand. Now, now turn around and look. Everyone raise their hand. The only one who didn't raise their hand was Glenn. Is the abomination of desolation the papacy in the book of Daniel? Okay, everyone in this room believes that. In Matthew 24, 15, um, which you have on page 103, it says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, brothers and sisters, how many books of the Bible did Jesus point out for us to study? Just a, just a few that you can draw inferences from, but definitely the book of Daniel. But he didn't just point to the book of Daniel, did he? He told us to understand a specific topic in the book of Daniel, did he not? When, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, understand this, correct? So he's, he's saying to Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world, because Matthew 24 is Jesus' sermon about the end of the world. He's saying to you and I, let's be correct about the abomination of desolation. Right? So in Great Controversy, Sister White describes the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. Right? We're all familiar with that, and we have some quotes here from the Great Controversy where she describes that. How was the abomination of desolation fulfilled? In the word which Sister White describes in the Great Controversy. <laughs> Wasn't what? Right, oh, pagan Rome comes to Jerusalem, AD 66. This was a sign to the Christians in Jerusalem. Is it AD 66 or has it been a long day for me? 66? I think it's 66. The Christians in Jerusalem know that this is the sign that Jesus gave. They plant the standards of, of their authority, which were flags that had idols on them, in the sacred precincts of the temple. They, that became a sign for the Christians in Jerusalem to flee. Right? Th that's the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation, right? And we need to understand this, right? Do you realize you just contradicted yourself? Jesus says, we need to understand this. And the pioneers were right about the abomination of desolation. It's the papacy, and we just all agreed in the secondary fashion that the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation was pagan Rome, not papal Rome. Yeah. So how do, we, how do we understand this? We understand this is that there's two fulfillments 
in the past of the abomination of desolation. The first fulfillment was by pagan Rome in the 80, 66 to 70 time period. And, and when we take the characteristics of the first fulfillment of the abomination of desolation, and then the characteristics of the second fulfillment of the abomination of desolation, it'll define the characteristics of the third fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. And we're familiar with the characteristics of the first fulfillment of the abomination of desolation, Rome. And it, before we move on, on, on page 103, one thing that I want you to take note of is that, if you will, is that um, in Luke, when it's commenting on the same sermon that Christ gave, when Luke is commenting on it, um, or it's Mark, I, I have Luke, I have Luke there, standing where it ought not, that's Mark 13, 14. Um, it says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. Now, when I first became a Christian, uh, Kathy and I became Christians and Adventist Christians right at the same time. You know, we didn't spend any time in Protestant Christianity. We came out of the world right into to Adventism, basically. And uh, we went into a church that was you know, highly educated uh, Walla Walla graduates that are the scientists out in California that make all the sophisticated weaponry um, that we use as we force the world to do what we want to do today. And so we, were, we went into a church that was um, very well supplied with a lot of intellectual Seventh-day Adventists. And they knew that they were Adventists all their life, most of them. They knew Adventism. We didn't. And they knew all the arguments that cast doubt upon the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So when I first come across passages in the Bible where Matthew is saying, uh, when you see the abomination of des desolations standing in the holy place, and Mark saying, standing where it ought not, well, there's a contradiction in the Bible. So that was pointed out to me, and for a while I had to sort, th sort through it. Now, is this a contradiction that Mark is saying that this sign is fulfilled by him standing where he ought not, and Matthew saying, standing in the holy place? Do you see the contradiction? It's not a contradiction. It's an expansion of the truth. The abomination of desolation can be fulfilled when it's, when it's standing in the holy place, but there, there may be a way that it can be fulfilled where it's standing where it ought not. So I want to put that into our mind. That's not a contradiction. It's an expansion of the understanding of the abomination of desolation. So what are the characteristics of the first time the abomination of desolation was fulfilled? We'll pass over this passage from the Great Controversy, which we should be semi-familiar with, and you can go to the 106 in your notes. These are the characteristics that I would suggest are found in the prophetic fulfillment of the destruction of Jerusalem in the 8070 time period. The abomination of desolation was a sign to flee. And that sign, of course, was when the flags, the standards of pagan Rome, were placed in the sacred precincts of the temple, which extended some furlongs outside the walls, but they were understood to be sacred, pre sacred ground. And when Pagan Rome placed those standards in there. That was the sign. And on those standards were the idolatrous symbols of Rome, which was a symbol of their power and their authority. And you don't want to remove the idea of the, that it was the, those idolatrous, idolatrous symbols because that's part of the story of the abomination of desolation. It was the mark of Rome, number two. Um, it was the standards of Rome's power placed in the sacred grounds. After the sign was placed, the Roman armies mysteriously and unexpectedly withdrew. And, and that's what the historians and Sister White points out. No, no reason why they didn't continue the siege and just bring Jerusalem down, but they withdrew. But that was according to God's will. The Christians knew they had to flee, and the Roman army um, pulled back. And that also brought the Jews thinking that they, they could prevail over Rome. So the Jews came out of Jerusalem and started chasing uh, the Roman armies, and it left the Christians all by themselves, basically in Jerusalem, so they could get out safely. And uh, to not obey that sign was death. Is that how you understand the characteristics of that history as set forth in the Great Controversy? Okay, that's, that's the first fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. Now, the second fulfillment of the abomination of desolation it's a little bit more obscure, but it's there. It's, it's portrayed in prophecy. Um, 
One of the things is, is that the mark of Rome's authority in the, the first abomination of desolation was placed in the holy place. Notice on page 106, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. This is the fulfillment of papal Rome, of the abomination of desolation. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Here is papal Rome's power in the sacred precincts of the temple where he shouldn't be proclaiming to be God. All right? Now there's more to it than that. In Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. One of the things that took place in AD 70 is that the de Jerusalem was destroyed and the sanctuary was trampled down, and during the 1260 years of papal rule, the holy city was trampled down not by pagan Rome, but by papal Rome. So in the Great Controversy, when Sister White is describing the time period of the establishment of the papacy at, in 538, if you read very carefully and you have some of this passage here on 106 and uh, onward, um, she's describing that as the idolatry was being brought into the Christian church by c Catholics, that those true Christians in the church knew that this was wrong, and it reached a point to where they realized that they were, the peace at any measure. I'm looking for uh, the, the, the statement. Okay, it's on the bottom of page 106. This is a summary of where the Christians during that time period arrived as they struggled with the mark of Rome's power. Her idolatry was being brought in to the sacred precincts of God's church and the papacy was being placed in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. The last sentence in there, a very common sentence in Adventism usually on page 106 is, if unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. So the true Christians during this time period that preceded the 1260 years when the papacy was gonna trample down the holy city realized that they, it, to compromise was death and they needed to separate. And the testimony of the Bible is, is during this 1260 year time period, the woman fled. The woman fled, just like the Christians in Jerusalem fled. And where did they flee during the 1260 year time period? They fled into the wilderness. So as you, as you dissect the, the abomination of desolation by pagan Rome, you see that although it's more obscure, I wouldn't argue that, the abomination of de desolation was fulfilled by papal Rome. When the Rome's authority, the, the, in Rome's authority, um, definitely the Sunday keeping is the mark of Rome's authority, but um, it's, it's connected with the idea that the Pope of Rome proclaims himself to be God on earth. Um, he's sitting in the temple of God, telling the whole world he is God. As, as that came into the Christian church in the the Pergamus time period, just before the Thyatira time period, um, the true Christians recognized that that was a sign that they could not stay in connection with that church, and they separated and they fled into the wilderness for 1260 years. That's the second abomination of desolation. Now, let me ask you a question. In that time period when the separation was going on and the true Christians were, were forced to separate, what if you decided that it would be better to stick around and try to um, insert a holy influence into that corrupt church? <laughs> You'd either get burned at the stake or, or, the, or the compromise around you, by beholding you become changed, you'd be lost by absorbing that, that atmosphere, correct? We understand that principle, by beholding you become changed. This was life or death to stay to stay in that place would be death, just like it was for Christians if they would have stayed in Jerusalem. 
So on p top page 108, we have the characteristics of the second abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation, uh, which the pioneers identified as the papacy and which wa was fulfilled also by the papal power, um, was a sign to separate by true Christians, a sign to flee. The sign was the mark of Rome, the combination of paganism and Christianity, which allows, provided uh, the, the argument for the pope to be the head of the churches, proclaim himself as God, sitting in the temple of God. Um, the sign was established when the standards of Rome power, papal Rome's power, were placed in the sacred grounds of the temple, and to obey the sign was certain death. To not obey the sign was certain death. So you have virtually the same characteristics in the second manifestation of the abomination of desolation, except um, that in pagan Rome there was an, a mysterious withdrawal. But remember, we've already touched on that. There, one line of prophecy may have more way marks than another line of prophecy, but it doesn't, it doesn't destroy. They complement one another. The fact that we don't see a mysterious withdrawal um, in, in papal Rome doesn't remove that from the testimony of the two witnesses. The first abomination of desolation, the characteristics there, combined with this, the second abomination of desolation, define the characteristics of when the third abomination of desolation is going to take place. So, if you read the next quote on page 108, it is no time now for God's people to be fixing their affections or laying up their treasures in the world. The time is not far distant when, like er the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desol desolate and solitary places. Now, brothers and sisters, what was she just doing there? What I just read, what was she speaking about? The early disciples, right? Sister White's going to describe a history in the future, and she goes, she's, Sister White is describing something that's going to take place in the future, and she goes back into history to give us an illustration of it. And what history did she go to? She went to the history of the time period when the early disciples were forced to flee from the papacy, right? They fled into the wilderness, okay? So she's, I want you to see, she's using the history of the, the second abomination of desolation that was fulfilled by the papacy as she's going to tell us about the abomination of desolation at the end of the world. It is no time now for God's people to be fixing their affection or laying up their treasures in the world. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the sage of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was a signal for the flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. Uh, and I know, you know, I've, I've shared this a couple times before, and the last comment I made, I know that we might have different ideas about that, but how from... <laughs> The first time the abomination of desolation was fulfilled in AD 70, the Christians went to a specific place, did they not? Where did the Christians go when they left Jerusalem? Judea. Antioch? Wasn't it Antioch? Didn't they go to Antioch? No. Where, where was it? Okay, it wasn't Antioch. Perea? Perea. Yeah. yeah. Perea. Okay. That, all right. That's right. They, that's what it was. And they went to that specific place. So when Sister White says, the, um, their time is not far distance when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate, desolate and solitary places. And then she goes into the destruction of Jerusalem. Some people will argue that she's talking about the, the Christians that fled from Jerusalem in AD 70. And I'm suggesting that the Christians that fled Jerusalem in AD 70, they went to a specific place. And it wasn't the desolate and solitary places. She's referring to the history of when the Christian church fled into the wilderness in the papal abomination of desolation. And she's, she's referring to what Jesus said about the abomination of desolation. She's referring to the abomination of desolation in AD 70, and she's referring to the abomination of desolation in the papal time period to explain the abomination of desolation that takes place at the end of the world. And she's saying that the Sunday law in the United States is the sign the, uh, of the abomination of desolation for God's people at the end of the world. Now, the characteristics of the third fulfillment of the abomination of desolation have been established by the first two abominations of desolation. Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. 
So, when you, how many of you are familiar with David Westbrook? I, I've never met the man, but I, and I've only heard one of his sermons, and I have many friends that I have confidence in that says, that t- tell me that he's a good man, and that's, uh, as far as I know, uh, that's correct evaluation. I, I see everyone's heads nodding. And the one presentation I've heard of his is on the abomination of desolation, and I disagree with him on a couple points, but it's a very good presentation. I did listen to it. A he, like most in Adventism, only sees two abominations of desolation, pagan Rome and this one here that we're dealing with, the Sunday law at the end of the world. And uh, so I'm not going to burden us with the the punchline of what he says. I'm going to tell you I agree with him fully. I agree with him fully. The abomination, the sign of the abomination of desolation at the end of the world was fulfilled in 1888 with the Blair Bill. But in agreement with the first time that the abomination of desolation was fulfilled in the 80-70 time period, the sign was put down at the Blair Bill, but then Rome mysteriously withdraws. That's one of the characteristics. It withdrew in 1888. And, if, and what he did in his presentation, if you remember, if you've heard that presentation of his, when he first come to understand this, he went and started looking at the, the quotations in Ellen White about country living. And he realized that before 1888, Sister White would be saying, the time is not far distance when we're going to have to move to the country. But after 1888, Sister White says, we should be in the country because the sign had already arrived in 1888. Now, that means 1,218 years ago, the Romans came and put the mark of their authority down in a place where they ought not, and it was a sign for Seventh-day Adventists to do what? To move out into the country. In the first abomination of desolation, if you stayed in Jerusalem, what did it mean? Death. In the second abomination of desolation, you all agreed, if you stayed in connection with the Roman church, what did it mean? Death. Brothers and sisters, what does it mean that we're not living in the country? We're supposed to be in the country for 118 years now. Rome mysteriously withdrew in 1888. And when she comes back, and she's coming back real soon based on Bible prophecy, it's too late too late. Now, a triple application of prophecy, they're simple, they're interesting. Let's face it, I mean, I'm Seventh-day Adventist just like you're Seventh-day Adventist. I know, I know pretty much just like you do what's interesting to the Adventist mind, if he has an interest in spiritual things at all. It's interesting to go through the three Elijahs. It's easy to follow, right? You see those three enemies, Jezebel, Ahab, the prophets of Baal, and the lights come on. Yeah, that's the beast, dragon, and false prophet. And wow, there's a lot of information in that simple little illustration. Those kind of things are fun, aren't they? They're easy to see. They're easy to share. But they're a triple application of prophecy. And a triple application of prophecy is dealing with Rome. And Rome establishes the vision. That's what it's all about, brothers and sisters. And the vision is the last six verses of Daniel 11. The vision is the last six verses of Daniel 11. That's the message of the hour. In the triple application of Rome, in terms of pagan Rome plus papal Rome, identifies modern Rome, one of the things that's in that triple application of prophecy that no fair-minded person can get around is that Rome does not begin to rule the world until three geographical obstacles are overcome. That's in pagan Rome, that's in papal Rome. Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. And the argument in Adventism today is, is the glorious land the United States of America, or is it the Seventh-day Adventist church? And brothers and sisters, the Seventh-day Adventist church is not a geographical area. And Rome establishes the vision. And in the triple application of prophecy of pagan Rome and papal Rome, identify modern Rome, the glorious land must be a geographical area. Must be. Rome establishes the vision, and these triple applications of prophecy is not just something that I thought up off my head. It is in God's word for this day and age. So what does a triple application of prophecy connected to the abomination of desolation tell us about the vision that that Rome establishes? Well, brothers and sisters, when the abomination of desolation is placed, where is it placed? In the holy place. Or, as Mark would say, 
in a place where it ought not. Right? There's a certain place that this mark of Rome is established that fulfills the sign to flee. And the abomination of desolation here at the end of the world, where is the, the mark placed? In the United States? In the government? Brothers and sisters, when you're talking about the glorious land, in verse 41 of Daniel 11, you have to understand that the glorious land is the United States of America. And the word glorious in the Hebrew, the primary definition, means in sense of prominence. And in the world today, the most prominent country, of course, is the United States, but that's kind of secondary. The real question is, what is the most prominent country in end time Bible prophecy? The United States. The United States is, is where uh, the great defender of religious liberty is established at the end of the world, and it's the great defender of religious liberty that ultimately speaks as a dragon and forces the whole world to worship the beast. So the United States has a specific role in end time Bible prophecy. And the, the strength, according to inspiration, this isn't off the top of my head, you can take many, many passages from Ellen White. The thing that made the United States prosperous and strong and powerful was what? The Constitution of the United States and the fact that it had enshrined within it the separation of church and state, separation of powers, the defender, defender of religious liberties. So brothers and sisters, when the mark of Rome's, uh, Rome's authority comes into the United States, it comes in to a place where it ought not, and that place does have a sacredness to it. It is a holy ground in that sense. The United States was designed by God, according to Sister White. So when you look at the abomination of desolation, first and second, you get the characteristics of the third. And when you get the characteristics of the third and you see Sister White saying that this sign is placed in the United States at the Sunday law time period, it is an argument that the United States is the glorious land. It has a specific role in Bible prophecy that has been divinely ordained by God from, from the beginning of its history till the end of time. And when you see that sign, it's a time to be in the country. And I hope we all are in this room. And I hope those that may listen to this tape or view this tape would take this seriously. Because the first two abomination desolations taught that to stay in the city was death. And you can see some quotes on the sacredness of the Constitution on page 109. The, on the bottom of page 109, you'll see one of the quotes where Sister White says, God designed the United States. Um, notice on page 110, it says, The foundations of civil and religious liberty, the bulwark of glory of this country. And then Sister White says this, Many were driven across the ocean to America, and here laid the foundations of civil and religious liberty, which have been the bulwark and what? Glory. The glory of this country. The United States have a, has a glory attached to it. In fact, it would be acceptable, based on this quote, to call the United States the glorious land. Brothers and sisters, Rome establishes the vision. The United States has been prefigured by pagan Rome. Pagan Rome is the power that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538. The United States, we know as Seventh-day Adventists, is the power that places the papacy on the throne of the earth at the end of the world. The obvious conclusion, when we understand that Jesus is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and ending, the obvious conclusion is that the, the power that first placed the papacy on the throne of the earth is prefiguring the power that finally places the papacy on the throne of the earth. And one of the characteristics of pagan Rome in Daniel 11, verse 31, which we've dealt with a couple times, is that the seven European kings, in the process of placing the papacy on the throne of the earth, in verse 31 of Daniel 11, they first stand up for the papacy. 
Then they pollute the sanctuary of strength. Then they remove the daily. Then they place the papacy on the throne of the earth. They do four things. They stand up. They pollute the sanctuary of strength. They remove the daily. They place the papacy. And the pioneers correctly understood that the phrase pollute the sanctuary of strength was identifying that pagan Rome destroyed the very thing that made them strong prophetically. And what, what did the pioneers say made Rome strong prophetically? The city of Rome. And in the warfare that took place in the Roman Empire after 330, the city of Rome is destroyed prophetically. What made Rome strong was the city of Rome. And verse 31 of Daniel 11 says that Rome itself destroyed the city of Rome. It polluted its sanctuary of strength. So brothers and sisters, prophetically, what is it that makes the United States strong? Prophetically. The Constitution of the United States. And in verse 41 of Daniel 11, the United States is going to pollute its sanctuary of strength. Now, <coughs> Another triple application of prophecy. If you accept the fact that Sister White says that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that the figures should not be changed and that we are to continue to present the message that was being proclaimed with this chart. She doesn't say it that way, but we've read the quotes where she says that just that. We're to continue to present the message that brought the people out of the churches in 1843 and 1844, and this is what the pioneers were using to proclaim that message. If you accept that, then you have to accept, and you should accept, because it's sound. They're what the pioneers have to say down in here about the fifth and sixth trumpet, that it's correct, and it is. My brothers and sisters, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet are also the first, second, and third woe. And the first two woes, the fifth and sixth trumpet, were fulfilled by 1844. So you have a triple application of prophecy. The first woe, the characteristics of the first woe, combined with the characteristics of the second woe, define the characteristics of the third woe if you retain the pioneer understanding of the woes. Follow the logic? Follow the logic? Pioneers taught correctly that the trumpets, all seven of them, were the providential forces that brought Rome down. They taught correctly that the first four trumpets are the powers that brought down Western Rome. The next two trumpets, the first two rows, brought down Eastern Rome and Papal Rome. So in, 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 in that time period, Papal Rome came down. So the pioneers say the trumpets are identifying the providential forces that bring down Rome, and the pioneers go so far to say that the seventh trumpet, which begins sounding on October 22, 1844, is identifying the providential forces that are going to bring down what? Modern Rome. That's, that's a logical understanding, right? That's what the trumpets are about. Who's modern Rome? The beast, the dragon, the false prophet. So during the time period of the seventh trumpet, one of the things we're looking about, looking at and expecting is how does this trumpet contribute or bring about the bringing down of modern Rome? The first woe, if read it in Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. The first row, all the trumpets, all the trumpets, by the way, are associated by historical figures. Um, you can see the, the uh, well, on the notes earlier we had them. The first trumpet is Alaric. I always get Alaric and Odiates are backwards. But I think Alaric's the first trumpet. The second trumpet is Genseric out of northern Africa. The third is Attila the Hun, and the fourth is Odiaser. Um, men associated with these trumpets. The fifth trumpet is Muhammad. That's the historical figure associated with the fifth trumpet. The sixth trumpet is Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. So that's one thing to understand about the, the trumpets is the pioneers associated them with certain historical figures. And they tell us that according to the symbols in Revelation 9, that the fifth trumpet, the first woe, 
that it was Islam, Arabic Islam in Arabia, um, associated with Muhammad, the birthplace of Islam, historical birthplace and figure that Islam follows, Muhammad, and that during the fifth trumpet, Islam would torment the armies of Rome. And that, you read it, it says torma, torment in the fifth trumpet. I wouldn't kill, wouldn't kill the armies of Rome in the fifth trumpet. The armies of Rome don't get killed uh, until the sixth trumpet. Um, so the fifth trumpet is dealing with Islam that torments, militarily torments the armies of Rome. And the style of their warfare is specifically identified in Revelation. They would strike suddenly and unexpectedly. They would, they would be riding their Arabian horses up over the sand dunes, and before the Roman soldiers even knew they were there, they were cut to pieces with their swords. They would, before the blood was done flowing, they'd be over the other sand dune on their horses. That was the style of fighting that is symbolized in the fifth trumpet that the pioneers identify with the fifth trumpet. They identified that method of warfare. They strike suddenly and unexpectedly. They weren't like the British in the Revolutionary War that lined up and walked into battle in unison. They had a different style of warfare that was specifically identified in the scriptures and in history, and the pioneers put these together. So the characteristics of the first wall on the top of page 111 is it was Islam, they would strike suddenly and unexpectedly against the armies of Rome, number three. And it says that they were directed by their tails, or that their power was in their tails, it will say, in, in the, the passage. And in Isaiah 9.15, it says, The ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. They were being directed or motivated by these false prophets. Okay, the, the, What we call today the imams, the Ben Ladens, the, the, who's the... The one in Iraq, uh, Zawahiri, Z Z still the same way of operating. Islam still, Zarqawi, Zarqawi. They're 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 doing the bid bidding of their religious leaders that are directing them, and not necessarily being being directly involved in the way for itself. That's what Islam how Islam worked during the time period of the fifth trumpet, and it tormented the armies of Rome. Now in the second this, the sixth trumpet, the second woe, during the time period symbolized by the Ottoman Empire, it was still Islam, but in that history, in that world history, what was invented? Gunpowder. So in terms of their, their mode of warfare, it was still the same. Strike suddenly, unexpectedly, with an emphasis on explosives. And in this time period, they weren't just going to torment the armies of Rome. They were to kill the armies of Rome. They were directed also by their heads and their tails, and they're the force that brought Rome down. Therefore, I just I say, say it this way. In a triple application of prophecy upon the testimony of two of things established, the first fulfillment, the characteristics of the first fulfillment combined with the characteristics of the second fulfillment define the third fulfillment. Therefore, I would submit to you that when the third woe arrives in history, we should expect it to be Islam. They should strike suddenly and unexpectedly with, an with, with explosives against who? The armies of Rome. Who, who is the armies of Rome at the end of the world? The United States of America. So if we reach a point in time where we see Islam at the end of the world, striking the United States suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives, you know for sure that the third woe has begun. Has that happened? Brothers and sisters, 9-11 was a fulfillment of prophecy. What does that mean? That means the Seventh-day Adventists are sleeping, conjecturing about what the beast and dragon and false prophet are, the providential forces that are going to bring down the beast, dragon, and false prophet have already begun to do it, and we don't even know for sure who it is. And they're already here. It's the United Nations, the United States, and the Vatican. Ah, you don't hear that much about the Vatican in the news today compared to the United Nations and the United States, do you? 
That's because Jezebel was off in Samaria, and Herodias was behind the scenes too. You hear a little bit about the Vatican, but in the forefront of the news is the United States and the United Nations. And who are they dealing with? Who are they dealing with this week? Iran, right? Didn't they just, didn't they just make a pronouncement this week about Iran? And what did the leader of Iran say? say? Well, this is the end of diplomacy. If they're going to try putting us in a corner and prevent us from making nuclear weapons, diplomacy is coming to the end. That was this week, brothers and sisters. Now, now, brothers and sisters, Sister White says plainly, the Lord would have come shortly after 1844 if God's people would have all entered in by faith to the most holy place and participated in that work. But did all of them enter in? So time was extended on. But when it comes to the woes in Revelation 11, we've read the passage. You have before the wrath of God, when Michael stands up, what do you have? The angering of the nations. And the angering of the nations was taking place in the Millerite time period. Go back to the history of the 1840s. Go read the newspapers of the 1840s. And what was going on in the world? The four great European powers were trying to solve what problem? The problem of Islam. Here we are at the end of the world, and it's not the four great European powers. It's changed. It's the United Nations, the dragon, and the false prophet, the United States. What are they trying to do? They're trying to solve the problems of Islam. The angering of the nations is here. Islam is fulfilling its role of tormenting the United States that leads up to a Sunday law. In the fifth trumpet, the first woe, where the armies of Roe are tormented, you know what, the, what it says in there? It says, hurt not those that have the seal of God. Hmm. When's the seal of God come in, brothers and sisters? At the Sunday law. Islam is going to torment the United States leading to the Sunday law. It's going to provide the providential environment that brings about the Sunday law, and it's going to continue to escalate until the beast dragon and false prophet come together into the threefold union, the one world government, and at which point the whole thing comes tumbling down. And Jesus returns. Michael stands up. Human probation closed. Brothers and sisters, this is, this is an agreement with the understanding of the pioneers of Adventism. You can defend it from the Bible. You can defend it from the spirit of prophecy. And you can demonstrate it from the newspapers that come out every day. What establishes the vision is Rome. What brings Rome down in Bible prophecy is the trumpets. But at the end of the world, what brings Rome down is Islam. That's the message that, that shows what takes place between verse 40 and verse 41. I mean, I always tell people the next thing to happen after the collapse of the Soviet Union in terms of Daniel 11 is the Sunday law in the United States, but I know that there's more to it than that because you can only say so much. What takes place between verse 40 and verse 41 in Daniel 11 is the third woe kicks in on September 11th, 2001, and begins to bring the cataclysmic events that drives this country to its knees, providing the place for a Sunday law to come in in a very rapid fashion. Rome establishes the vision. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would enlighten our minds with the presence of your Holy Spirit so we can understand if these things are really so. If these are true representations of what you're saying to us through your prophetic word, we must understand them. We must incorporate them into our experience and by faith act upon them correctly. If they're false, give us the discernment to see that. Give us the courage to, to oppose them. But brothers and sisters, dear Heavenly Father, a, as your people, we, we want to understand these things um, if they are true in such a way that, that our life is brought into agreement with these truths and that we be about our business of going out and warning those around us of what's taking place on planet Earth. We understand from the prophetic testimony, Lord, that we are the people that have been chosen 
to clarify the issues at the end of the world. We're the people represented by Daniel as Babylon comes tumbling down and the handwriting's on the wall. But if we can't read the handwriting, we can't participate in that experience. We wish to understand these messages in a way that we can stand there as all the world is tumbling down and give a clear and winning testimony to those people outside of Adventism that haven't yet come to grips with these things. And we thank you for the, the privilege of, of investigating these things and ask you to continue to impress us with, uh, with these truths. In Jesus' name, amen.